Hi, this presentation is about establishing a real rights theory. Uh, first of all, we'll look at defining ownership. So according to, to Bell and Guffrey, uh, chief attribute of property is the right of deriving from land and its accessories all the uses and services of which they are capable. This right may be considered in relation to others as exclusive or in relation to the subject, i.e. the land, as absolute. So when it says absolute, what does it mean? Once you're in the land, you have absolute dominion. You have the right to do anything. Really? Um, it's not completely that clear. So except by the jurisdiction, ownership of land is never absolute. Uh, and this is described well in the Dutch Civil Code, which says that ownership is the most comprehensive property right for the person, um, the owner, can have uh, in a thing. The owner is free to use the item to the exclusion of anyone, provided the use does not conflict with the rights of others and restrictions based upon statutory regulations and rules of unwritten law are observed. So you do have absolute dominion, but it's constrained. It's constrained by uh, the common rules within the jurisdiction itself. So the reality is uh, that you are effectively constrained uh, you sorry, but you have the right to do anything subject to social norms uh, and legal restrictions. But you will also have the power to vary your right, and that includes the power to transfer and grant rights to third parties. But the Bell and Guffrey quote also described ownership as exclusive. So once you own the land, you have exclusivity over the owned land. Trespassers and others who interfere with this exclusivity may be restrained. And this exclusivity is good against the world. That means that you don't necessarily need to know who these other parties are who might transgress or, um, or come onto your land. Uh, but they should be bound by an obligation or a duty to respect the land that you own. And then, according to Penner, uh, the right to property itself is the right that correlates to the duty in REM that all others have to exclude themselves from the property of others, which uh, succinctly encapsulates that. An owner also has the discretionary power not to exclude people from their land by providing them with rights. So ownership in many respects, it also provides a power to vary these rights relationships. And as described by Penner, property is a gate, not a wall, because the owner may open the gate, selectively allowing particular persons to enter, while at the same time leaving everyone else who is, on, uh, who is outside in the same position as before. So, in terms of these rights that can be allocated, uh, we need to look at this in terms of the legislative framework, which are used to deliver uh, legal instruments. And these registrable rights are of a set of registrable rights that are referred to as numerous clauses. And this is the universe of property forms, which is closed and should remain so because of the high information costs that will be imposed if parties were free to create just any kind of property interest. So essentially it's saying, you know, in order to register these things, there is a subset because, you know, one, this will reflect most things, and two, by having lots of random things thrown in here, the rights and obligations that are implied by these will be difficult for people to understand. So there is a communication cost. So absolute dominion, as we described earlier, is held by the jurisdiction in that legal framework, and they have the ability to formalise uh, what rights uh, should be um, made available within the jurisdiction. Uh, and then uh, allocate the associated powers uh, associated with those those rights of ownership and then specifically refine what goes on for real property as well, so land law. And this produces numerous clauses. Then the jurisdiction can start to separate and reserved rights. Now we've broken this up into two elements. We call them reserved instance and these are the rights and powers reserved by the jurisdiction defined by legal instruments, so a statute reserving all of the petroleum uh, um, in a, a jurisdiction uh, is relevant here. Uh, and this could be reserved property, ownership rights reserved by the jurisdiction. Now these can be made available to private parties using an express grant, 
all restricted rights and so non-ownership rights reserved by this jurisdiction act as restrictions on owners of possessions and these are referred to also as public law restrictions and these can be temporarily eased by the granting of a license or permit so here we're looking at kind of building control or planning or environmental control and then what remains are things that we refer to as conventional instance and this is private property and abstractable rights and powers available through the conveyancing process so this is you know primarily the land and the abstractable rights that people can uh, use uh, as as they buy and sell or private individu individuals can use as they buy and sell and this conventional property is the nearest thing to absolute ownership of land by private parties and then you can start to separate out and reserve some of the rights and powers by conveyancing so you can separate out leases securities easements covenants uh, or if it's ownership you can have sub ownership like strata and minerals and the thing about the that whole conveyancing system it's an in personam system so you have a known buyer who is sorry you have a known owner who is transferring rights to a known benefitor So we've used rights in REM uh, a few times and this, uh, this term rights in REM is characterised as those rights which bind all the world, uh, that is rights which must be respected by all or virtually all of the subjects of a legal system. So for example everybody must refrain from trespassing on my land uh, as stated by Penner. And all of these kind of you know Reserved instance and conventional instance, as we described earlier, have in rem characteristics. So um, the duty owing parties to these uh, rights are unspecified but many. So, for example, for a building restriction, they are represented spatially and they have an impact against all owners who have a relationship with that spatial extent. You don't know who they are uh, necessarily. Um, but they have that duty and obligation to that you know building control and likewise for um, you know uh, uh, any other piece of owned land in terms of trespass so when we encounter things which is marked in the conventional manner as being owned we know that we're subject to certain negative duties of abstention with respect to that thing so we're not to enter upon it we're not to use it and we're not to take it and we know all of this without ever having any idea who the owner of the thing actually is and so these universal duties are broadcast to the world from the thing itself so essentially you don't need to know anything about the owner uh, or what the owner is going to do with that land in order to understand that you as a party uh, have uh, obligations and duties to that owner not to trespass for example and there is no formalized contract between the owner and the duty holder that reflects this So we're now going to go into a little bit more detail about these in personam relationships in terms of how we separate and reserve rights and powers by conveyancing. So contract law and conveyancing is used to legally transfer private and reserve property and this occurs between a granting party and a grantee party. All parties within the contract are known and it's thus referred to as in personam. However, Penner states that the better view of contract is that it is law governing the power to re rearrange or create rights, duties and powers by agreement. Owners of conventional property can use their powers to alienate the legally permissible use and service rights, as defined in numerous clauses, and then grant them in personam to third parties. And these separated real rights can represent both ownership and non-ownership rights. Uh, and we can see this here in terms of the LADM model. So we can have a transaction that represents a, a party uh, transfer. So here we're just uh, selling ownership uh, or transferring ownership or a land transfer where we're subdividing the land or a rights transfer or a rights alienation. So we're alienating sub-ownership from the primary land to create flats or alienating uh, road access from this kind of bundle of rights so your neighbour can have a, an easement and a right of access over your land uh, and previously you would have alienated out a mortgage over the same extent. 
Uh, and you can use a number of different uh, private conveyancing transactions. So here we've got a, a transfer of parties, a transfer of right and a transfer of land to actually undertake those LADM level changes. So a transfer of party part and whole where you're uh, giving a part of your interest uh, or the whole of your interest in that land. The transfer of right part and whole where you're abstracting and alienating a spatially constrained right from your bundle of rights or you're uh, uh, passing over a a right that represents a whole of your area so strata and security respectively and a transfer of land which you're just using to subdivide your land and so here we're starting to use this bundle of sticks model uh, to describe these rights relationships um, and so the bundle of sticks model allows us to describe the numerous clauses rights transactions between parties in personam with fine granularity and this specificity is initial for, for complex governments arrangements particularly when we're doing things like strats and uh, sorry flats and other strata uh, relationships and we talk about that in another presentation for an example an owner might have one set of rights to their dwelling but a different set of rights to access their parking space or a different set of rights to the common areas of their development such as a swimming pool so the bundle of sticks model can be summarized after simpson uh, and merrill and smith as ownership is a bundle the owner can distribute sticks from the bundle the owner can create a new bundle by separating sub ownership uh, and this new bundle is also ownership uh, the number and identity of the sticks can vary from thing to thing and place to place and person to person and is determined primarily by the jurisdiction through its laws and the sticks can be separated from the model and distributed uh, or acquired uh, in different ways the sticks can be held for different periods and when this period expires the sticks are returned back to the bundle and the sticks can be held by different parties or the same stick can be shared by different parties so as we said ownership is the containing bundle and it's possible for the owner of a bundle to own all sticks own some of the sticks or not own any sticks and this is a, a an element called proprietus nuda or bare ownership uh, and essentially ownership then is a catch-all but when all of these other rights such as the leases expire the ownership is there just to collect them all and just say you know i now have all of these rights back and this is how essentially we can use the in personam element to separate out all of these different right types on an in personam basis. Okay, so we've talked about rights, but also rights represent relationships and rights are given meaning when used to describe these relationships between parties framed through land because we're dealing with a land register and this is well described by Williamson et al so a right is not a relationship between an owner and land i.e party right and land model it's a relationship between an owner and others in relation to land backed up by the state in the case of legal rights each restriction and responsibility it involves a duality that imposes obligations on owners in relation to the land for the benefit of others. So the duality between owners uh, and right holders is implicit in this kind of party right land model. Uh, an administrative framework is robust and successful when it takes this duality into account. Uh, and this is followed by uh, Penner that says, thus at a theoretical level, we understand the right to property equally as a right of exclusion or a right of use, since they are opposite sides of the same coin. Further, a person is a bearer of a right when a duty is imposed in order to serve or protect this interest. So if such a position is true, then a right holder must invoke a duty in a third part on a third party. This means that for every party that benefits from a right, there must be a different party holds a corresponding correlative duty so in terms of these concepts land and the owner of land can benefit from a right or be encumbered by a duty also a right holder has certain powers associated with their right and this power is a capacity whether a natural capacity or a social capacity which works to change the relationships between people so in a seminal paper, Wesley Hoffeld uh, formally modelled rights, duties and powers as reciprocal implications and relationships. 
So Hoffeld created four basic components of rights known as Hoffeldian instance. So there's primary rules, which are rights, the privilege and the claim, and secondary rules, the power and the immunity. So primary rights, uh, the privilege and claim, are rules that require people to perform or refrain from performing particular actions. So there is a privilege. You have a, a right to pick up a shell that you find on a beach. This right is a privilege. A has a privilege to do something if and only if A has no duty not to do something. So this very much summarizes that absolute dominion. You, know, you can do whatever you want to do as long as there's nothing that tells you that you can't do it. And then there's a claim. So a contract between an employer and an employee confers on the employee a right to be paid her wages. This right is a claim. So A has a claim that B does something if and only if B has a duty to A to do that thing. You know, essentially refined into a contract. And then uh, the secondary rules specify how agents can introduce and change rights, or these primary rules. So there are powers, and a Hofheldian power is the instant that enables agents to alter their rights. A has a power if and only if A has the ability to alter her own or another's Hofheldian incidents. So an owner has the power to be al alter their ownership right by transferring it to a third party. The ability to transfer a right to a different party is a power. Uh, and then there's immunities. So when A has the ability to alter B's rights, then A has a power. When A lacks the ability to alter B's right, then B has an immunity. So B has an immunity if and only if uh, A lacks the ability to alter B's right. So this is really important because immunities prevent other parties from waiving and nulling or more importantly transferring your claim over your property. You cannot sell what you do not own. And there are a number of opposites and correlatives that are associated with this. And we'll look at this in terms of the uh, correlatives. So correlatives are inferences against a different right holder. So if A has a claim, then some person B has a duty. Likewise, if A has a privilege, then B has a no claim. If A has a power, then B has a liability. And if A has an immunity, then person B has a disability. But here, this relationship between A and B in terms of claim and duty is the most important element for our modeling. Now I've got more on this and is more in the uh, associated paper but we'll skip through for um, expediency at the moment. So rights are given meaning when used to describe relationships between parties framed through land. So rights, uh, a rights holding party has immunities. The principal unity for an, uh, an owning party is immunity from transfer cannot sell what you do not own. A right holding party can expect duties from third parties. These parties could be named as part of an in personam contract or not named as part of an in rem relationship which is good against the world. When a right is alienated uh, and granted to a new right holding party these third parties can expect a duty from the landowner and the powers and immunities held by these third parties may be limited. So for example uh, a landowner may grant me a right of access over their land uh, or me by proxy through my land as their neighbour uh, however I cannot sell that right of access directly. Um, you know, I can transfer it if I sell the land my land, but I can't, you know, alienate that right of access on its own. I do not have the power. We haven't really talked about two of the core LADM concepts, restrictions and responsibilities. And it's principally because restrictions and responsibilities are in both general rights which encumber owned land. They describe a rights relationship that affects owned land. Yeah, it sounds quite familiar in terms of all of the things we've talked about in terms of duality and Hofheldian relationships. So for the owning party, encumbrances are you know, potentially shared use of land, a duty, so it's maps to an LADM responsibility. So while the owner can continue, continue to enjoy the right, the owner also has a duty to allow a right holder the ability to enjoy the right. So this is access, for example. Obligations on the landowner, also a duty. This maps to a, a, another LADM responsibility. Uh, the owner must undertake activities to satisfy the contract with the right holder, i.e. maintenance or reinstatement rights, or the owner must not undertake activities to satisfy the, the contract with the right holder, e.g. to impede an access way. So you can see here that access could be falling into two areas. There is a, a, a right to enjoy something, but there is also a, a right not to be impeded in that enjoyment. 
and then restrictions a duty uh, and this also maps to the LADM, sorry, this maps to the LADM restriction. So the owner can no longer has never or has never been able to benefit from the right, i.e. that right has never been in their, their bundle of sticks, as it were. Um, and so theoretically, this right is controlled by a third party and the owner must negotiate or get a permit to enjoy the right. And this is broadly what's covered by the restrictions which are abstracted by the jurisdiction uh, during the numerous clauses, those reserved incidents we talked about earlier. However, LADM re uh, defines restrictions and responsibilities as follows. So a restriction is a formal or informal obligation on a landowner to refrain from doing something. And a responsibility is a formal or informal obligation on a landowner to allow or do something. So modelling restrictions and responsibilities in this manner ref uh, frames such encumbrances in terms of their impact on a landowner. Uh, rather than the right which is independently registrable, so the right holder can enforce their benefit. So this is a distinct, uh, sorry, this, is a, this distinction is subtle uh, but important because this is about what is being registered. Are we registering the impact on the landowner or are we registering the right which is held by an independent party and this in many respects reflects you know one how your model is built but two you know what you actually want your register to be there for so breaking this down into to semantics in terms of some of the hof helgen relationships we've described earlier there are rights things that a landowner can do the owning party has been granted an ownership right in personam all ownership rights have in rem effects. The owning party may also have beneficial rights over other land granted in personam, and these may be held directly by the owner, or more likely they'll be pradially held uh, by proxy through the owned land. There are restrictions, things a landowner must refrain from doing. So the jurisdiction has a reserved incidence, uh, incident uh, with a spatial relationship with the owned land. The owner has an in rem duty to abide by the restriction and the owner can request a license to release them from the obligation. A third party has been granted rights in personam over the own, owned land that provide exclusivity. So for example a right of lease or life rent or sub ownership. Such rights tend to be time limited and the rights revert back to the owner on expiration. And then responsibilities, things that a landowner has to do or allow. So a third party has been granted a right in personam of your owned land. This results in an owned, owed duty. The duty owed by the landowner can either be passive uh, or negative, and it allows third parties to do things on the owned land, or it is active or positive, which enforces the owner to do things to or on behalf of the owned land. And so here we can see how we're starting to model that duality. So we can have owners uh, or the owner of a main plot, and that main plot has beneficial elements with other pieces of land here. Uh, so we see that it has an interest in the building, and which in turn has interest in other bits. This creates our subjects, which are our spatially owned interests. So we have our flat, the flatted building, what looks to be uh, an owned strip of land between two flats and a, a shared bit out the back. Um, but then we can start to derive our com and encumbrances. Um, and here we're seeing that, uh, uh, sorry, an aparty index is used here because it's linked through based upon cadastral unit. Uh, and then we're seeing the spatial relationships between this and other rights. So there's an environment deed which is a restriction held by an overriding interest. We have a community deed which is a responsibility between infrastructure elements. So there's another flat next door which benefit and encumber uh, both sides of a party and a developer deed which has a restriction here of no keeping of chickens and that will be enforced by the community. So LADM allows a right holder relationship to be clearly articulated in terms of party right and land. However, it's less clear about how right holder duty owing relationship duality is expressed. Uh, and currently framing restrictions and responsibilities in terms of our impact on own land doesn't help. However, LADM is a general model and should be applicable to the widest range of circumstances. The LADM restriction responsibility concepts will remain important modeling tools for informal social tenure models. Uh, and they do need to be uh, continued in as broad a way as possible. So in terms of just wrapping up, 
Smith argues that in general legal property theories are weak. This is something that the legal community needs to improve on. And this paper is attempted to provide a background architecture to the representation of real rights in land. So we've used a bundle of sticks model for representing in personum rights and a law of things model is useful for representing in rem rights. And it should be noted that nothing in this paper requires a change to the LADM architecture, but the, mo uh, the concepts themselves support automated modelling. Finally, this approach is tentative and would benefit from further uh, formalization, and it, but it is hoped it supports a new way to conceptualize and model rights relationships based on core LADM primitives. Thank you very much.